Okay, so my name is Alison Wilson. Um, um, my reviews on the formation and effect of topologically close patch phases in nickel-based superalloys. <coughs> um, so first of all, why is this an important, interesting issue to review? Um, well, nickel-based superalloys are used for the components in gas turbine engines that experience the highest conditions of stress and temperature. Um, however, the next generations of alloys, of components, are going to require to operate at even higher temperatures because new environmental legislation, new environmental targets for emissions from aircraft requires it to operate at higher temperatures in order to increase the thermal efficiency and therefore reduce emissions. Um, so the current superalloys that we have can't work at these conditions, so we need to design new ones. And in particular here, I'm considering both alloys for turbine discs, which we use polycrystalline alloys for, and turbine blades, which are single crystal alloys. Um, so what do we need to do in order to uh, design alloys that will work at these higher temperatures? Well, first of all, to increase the refractory element contents of these alloys, so the molybdenum, the tungsten, um, the rhenium in single crystals. Um, this is to provide sufficient solid solution strengthening. Um, and also we need to improve, increase the chromium for the strengthening and also to provide environmental resistance. Um, the problem with this, which is where this fits in, is that... These are the same elements that promote the formation of brittle intermetallic phases over long periods of time at high temperatures, such as in operation in the engine. Um, and these are the topologically close packed, or TCP, phases. So the aim of this review is to provide um, the state of current knowledge for how why these phases form and the effects they can have on the mechanical properties of these alloys um, to help with design of next generation alloys. So the review covers four main areas. First of all, factors affecting TCP precipitation. So this is concentration of individual elements, um, the application of stress during the thermal exposure, amongst other things. Uh, secondly, the prediction of TCP formation. What different methods can we use to try and predict whether a new alloy composition will form TCPs or not? And what are the fundamental um, ideas that these methods are based on. Thirdly, the different mechanisms by which these precipitates, once they've formed, affect the mechanical properties of the alloy and how severe this effect is. And finally, um, precipitate characteristics such as precipitate morphology or volume fractions that determine the magnitude of the effect they're going to have on the alloy. Um, in today's presentation, I'm just going to focus on two of these. Um, the factors affecting precipitation and the mechanisms by which these affect the mechanical properties. Um, before I do that, a quick recap of nickel-based superalloys. Um, so their microstructure is based on two main phases, um, the gamma and gamma prime phase. So these are illustrated in this micrograph here. Uh, the gamma is a nickel-based phase-centred cubic phase, and then the gamma prime is I'm supposed to say gamma prime is um, <laughs> A, the main strengthening phase, which is a super lattice FCC structure. Um, you can see it here for a uh, single crystal alloy, CMSX4, in a solution treat heat treated state. Um, this is a very high volume fraction of gamma prime, but that will vary depending on the alloy composition and processing. Um, as well as these two main phases, you get a variety of other minor phases that can form carbides, borides, and then these TCPs that I'm interested in. I've got an example over here in a different single crystal of um, basket weave structure of TCP phases that have formed after exposure for 100 hours at 11.25 degrees C. Um, so there it's basket weave morphology. You can get a variety of different morphologies. You can get plate-like structures. You can get spheroidal structures, depending on the alloy, the composition, all sorts of things. So back to factors that affect TCP precipitation. We need to look at the effect of individual element concentrations. Um, as I said previously, this is very important because we are always trying to push up the concentration of refractory elements and similar in order to improve the properties of the alloy. So what we're really interested in is finding that limit where we can get the best possible mechanical properties whilst not tipping over into forming too many of these TCP phases. Um, so the first effect that some elements in the alloy will have is a direct effect. So this is mainly refractory elements, um, molybdenum, tungsten, rhenium, chromium, 
um, which directly contribute to forming the TCP phase precipitate. Um, but these elements can also have an indirect effect, and so can lots of other, um, all the other elements that you put into the alloy. And they can have an indirect effect in various ways. First of all, by changing how different elements within the alloy partition between the gamma and gamma prime phases. For example, if you can add an element which might cause the chromium to partition even more strongly than normal towards the gamma phase, then you're going to increase the propensity of the alloy to precipitate TCP phases. Um, the second is by changing the volume fraction of the gamma prime. Um, so most obviously this would be elements like aluminium, titanium and tantalum, which directly um, increase the amount of gamma prime phase which forms, thereby again increasing the concentration of other refractory elements in the gamma phase and making it more likely to precipitate TCPs. And finally, um, elements can affect the precipitation of other minor phases, such as the carbides and borides, um, which can then interact with the TCPs in different ways, either promoting or suppressing uh, their formation. Um, so in this case, I'm going to look at one particular element um, to illustrate some of these effects, which is carbon. Um, carbon is added in fairly small amounts to nickel-based superalloys, um, but it can still have a very big effect on the formation of TCPs. Um, the first effect that I'm illustrating here is an interaction between MC carbides and sigma phase, which is one of the common types of TCP phases that forms in these alloys. Um, you can see in the image over here that you've got an MC carbide in the centre there, and then sigma phase forming directly adjacent to it. Um, this is commonly seen, and the reason for this is illustrated by this data here. Um, if you look at the triangular data points, they show the composition of the alloy directly adjacent to the MC carbide as compared to other regions within the alloy. And you can see that it's elevated, particularly in chromium, but also compared to some other regions in rhenium and some of the other elements. So as the MC carbide forms, it rejects the, um, these elements such as chromium into the surrounding matrix and therefore promotes the formation of TCP phases. Um, another way in which carbon can interact with TCPs is with M23C6 carbides. Um, now originally there has been an idea that, was proposed by Sims originally, that M23C6 and Sigma have a nucleation relationship. So they have a very similar crystal structure and it was, it's thought, it has been proposed that the, N, the sigma will preferentially nucleate on the N23C6. However, although this idea has been repeated a lot of times through various papers, um, no one's actually shown any convincing evidence of it. In fact, people have started to say, well, we can't find it, maybe it doesn't actually exist at all. Um, what is definitely agreed on is that there is a direct competition for elements between the N23C6 and the sigma. Um, and this is illustrated here by Lee et al. So this is for one particular alloy, which has been exposed at 871 degrees C for increasing time periods, and at 982 degrees C. And this is below and above the sigma solvus temperature for the alloy. Um, so if you look on the right, above the solvus temperature, you can see that the weight percent of N23C6 is increasing, as you would expect, and the weight percent of MC is decreasing. If you go down here to 871 degrees C, um, the same thing is still happening to the N23C6 and the MC, but now you've got these green triangles, which is sigma phase also precipitating. And you can see the relative amount of N23C6, which is formed, has decreased compared to the higher temperature. Obviously, there'll be some effect due to the fact that the temperature is different, but that is a larger effect than you would expect just from that. So you can conclude that the sigma is competing for the same elements and therefore reducing the amount of N23C6 formed. Um, and there's one more effect that carbon can have um, in single crystals where frequently TCP precipitation occurs in particular regions as a result of remnant dendritic segregation, which you can't get rid of during standard um, heat treating processes. Um, now, there's a lot of disagreement over this. Some people have seen carbon appearing to increase the amount of segregation and therefore to make the alloy more likely to precipitate TCPs. In other alloy compositions, it seems to decrease the amount of segregation and therefore make them less likely to form TCPs. So there's still 
work to be done in that area and working out what's actually going on. Um, if we go on to look at mechanisms by which the TCPC TCP precipitation affects the mechanical properties. Um, it can divide into three main areas. The first is crack initiation and propagation. I'll look at that one in more detail in a minute, so leave that for now. The second is the depletion of refractory elements in the gamma phase. So as I've said, the TCPs form from the gamma phase um, and take lots of the refractory elements, such as nitrogen, tungsten, rhenium, out. Um, so we would expect this to obviously reduce the concentration of these elements in that phase, therefore reduce the mechanical properties of that phase by stopping solid solution, well, reducing the amount of solid solution strengthening and similar things. Um, it seems you know, very likely that this is occurring. Um, the refractory elements have definitely got to be coming from the gamma phase and going into the TCPs, but it has been pointed out that no one has actually attempted to quantify how much of an effect this is having. So the presence of TCPs, um, people will generally attribute a great amount of the effect of the mechanical properties to this effect of depleting the refractory elements, but no one has tried to quantify, actually confirm how much of the effect is coming from that. Um, the third area is the disruption of gamma gamma prime rafting behaviour in single crystals. Um, so during creep in single crystals, you can form a stable gamma gamma prime rafted microstructure. But when you then precipitate a TCP phase, you disrupt that stable microstructure. And the gamma prime envelope that forms around the TCP precipitate um, provides a easy path for crack propagation through the microstructure, which wouldn't normally be there. Um, so to look in a bit more detail at the first one of those, the crack initiation and propagation, um, as I said before, these TCPs are brittle intermetallic phases and therefore likely to crack much more readily than the surrounding matrix and gamma prime. Um, and this can be seen here for some mu precipitates um, in a tensile specimen. And you can see between by the white arrows where the precipitates have internally cracked. However, the interesting thing in this micrograph is that although this cracking has occurred, there is no sign of the cracks propagating into the matrix and therefore actually contributing towards failure. Um, and this seems to vary between different materials. Sometimes you can see an effect of the cracks propagating and having an effect, and other times it appears to remain localised in the precipitates themselves. Um, so that's another area where no mechanisms have really satisfactorily been explained as to why sometimes the cracks remain localised to the precipitate and other times why it goes into the rest of the alloy and affects the, um, the fracture. Other mechanisms by which it can affect crack initiation is through uh, pores. So particularly when TCP phases form at high temperatures, they're often associated um, with formation of cavities near them, which can then act as crack initiation sites. Um, and an example here is um, actually of creep cavitation, so where the cavities have formed during tertiary creep and provided the initiation sites at TCPs um, in order for failure to occur. Um, and a final mechanism associated with this is to do with crack propagation. Um, sometimes you can get TCP phases that form as continuous, continuous brittle phases along the grain boundaries, therefore providing very easy crack propagation paths and greatly reducing various mechanical properties. So What's the current status on this? Well, the main issue is that frequently when designing new alloys, we can do our standard um, thermal stability testing, put the alloy in the furnace for a number of hours and see what occurs, uh, usually identify the TCPs which have formed in that time. But we don't then know what, A, exactly what it is in the composition, which means that this may have formed in this alloy but not in the previous one, um, or, in particular, how much effect this is actually going to have on the mechanical properties. Is it something that we can tolerate, or is it going to be so detrimental in service that we can't use this alloy? Um, I've highlighted a few areas that I think <coughs> require most further work. Um, the first is for the effect of particular element concentrations in the alloy, and also the mechanisms by which they work. 
Um, particularly here, I've got cobalt, ruthenium, and carbon. Ruthenium, we know, um, is very effective at preventing TCP formation in single crystals, particularly ones that contain rhenium. But there's a lot of debate over the mechanisms as to how that's happening. Um, and cobalt is a key one where, in some cases, people are trying to increase cobalt concentrations in nickel superalloys, but it's really unclear what role that's playing in TCP formation. Um, secondly, the critical volume fraction of TCPs. And what I mean by this is that with how far we're trying to push refractory element contents, it's unlikely that you're going to get alloys that will remain completely TCP free throughout their lifetime. But what we don't know at the moment is what volume fraction can be tolerated, um, and therefore how far can we push the compositions. Um, thirdly, the effect of stress on TCP formation. Um, obviously, in service in an engine, the components are not only experiencing long-term thermal exposure, but also varying stresses of fairly high amounts. Um, and stress, again, has been seen in different alloys to have a different effect. Sometimes, standardly, you'd think that increasing the stress will increase the TCP formation, and that is often seen. But in other alloys, um, they've increased the stress, and this has suppressed TCP formation, or in a fairly random way that no one's been able to explain the magnitude of the stress either suppresses or increases TC formation. And again, various mechanisms have been proposed, but no conclusions have been drawn. Um, and finally, this issue of when cracks propagate into the matrix and become a problem, and when they remain localised within the precipitates. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.